Today we'll be talking about a bizarre piece of lost media. We'll be talking about a VHS tape that might have been sent to us from another dimension. And we'll also talk about a very curious case of one of our most beloved 2010s pop icons that seemingly vanished into thin air one day. But first, hi. I'm Jeff, and if you're watching this, which you are, you probably know what an ARG is. But on the off chance that you don't, here's a very brief summary. The ARG, or alternate reality game, is a form of interactive transmedia storytelling where instead of being reduced to a passive consumer, as is the case with most traditional media such as theaters, films and books, the audience instead actively engages with the media and interacts with the characters within it. This is often done through social media, puzzle solving, scavenger hunts and basically anything under the sun that can be used to further a story. ARG started off being used as a marketing tool for movies and or video games but was pretty quickly adopted by independent creators who, rather than writing a self-published novel or directing a low-budget feature film, used the availability of cheap gear and platforms such as YouTube and Twitter to tell their stories. But what does all of this mean in practice? Well, you know when you're watching a horror movie and you're talking to the characters on screen and you're going Don't go there! Why? Why would you do that? Go back inside! But of course they don't listen and then they die. But in an ARG, if you were to try and do that exact same thing, the character might actually go Oh! That's actually a pretty good idea. I shouldn't go out here by myself. Thanks. And then they'll go back inside. Except as it turns out, the killer was actually inside of the house all along. And now you have to live with the guilt because you told them to go here. This is your fault. Why did you do this? I myself have created a few ARGs, most notably 10 tapes that got decently popular and almost killed me, and then there was Cloud City, which was conceptually really cool and interesting, but nobody cared. And then most recently I launched my third project, Jim Von Loan, which should be linked up in one of these corners. So with all of that out of the way, let me tell you something that I've learned. Starting an ARG is surprisingly easy. You could get up right now and have the first piece of content published before this video has finished playing. However, getting people to actually consume your ARG is significantly harder. This is for a myriad of reasons that I won't really be going into right now, so instead you'll just have to take my word for it when I tell you that because of how hard it can be to find an audience for your ARG projects, there are countless amazing projects out there that are ongoing, abandoned, finished, whatever, and they're just existing on some YouTube channel with 14 subscribers and 65 views. And the main reason for that is pretty simple. No one has simply taken the time to investigate them further. Until now. Because I want to try and do what I can to give these projects the attention they deserve. I don't have the furthest reach, but hopefully I can shine a little bit of a light on them. And I mean, there are so many good projects out there, and I can only cover so many, so I hope to do more of these videos in the future. But for now, we're gonna start with three projects. Now this won't be your Nexpo Nightmind type recap of the entire thing where we analyze every code and break down every aspect of the narrative because what I would rather do is introduce you to these projects and scrape the surface a little bit and hopefully if I do my job right I create an itch that you feel that you have to go and scratch for yourself. So let's begin with right. Normally this would be the part of the video where I tell you to go check out the original project first and then return here, uh, followed by about a 10 second break of silence that you awkwardly sit through. But since we won't actually be going into full spoilers for these projects, we don't actually have to do that. Instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about a 10 second break for you to sit alone in silence and think about the fact that you should be ashamed of yourself if you call yourself an ARG fan but you don't even have the decency to spend 30 minutes consuming one. Okay, let's begin. On July 22nd, 1978, an independent miniseries aired on the BBC, entitled Behind the Curtain. Within four days of its initial broadcast, it disappeared from the screens along with its creator. This is an archive of that show. 
That's the setup for the first project that we're going to be looking into today. This project is primarily, at least so far, taking place in a Twitter thread, along with a couple of YouTube videos. The Twitter thread starts off with a screenshot featuring promotional art for the miniseries. Beneath that, we learn that the author of the thread, who I from now on will refer to as just the author, has reached out to various crew members who helped create this elusive series. As previously mentioned, the director, Andrew Skinner, seemingly disappeared around the same time as the show was pulled from air. But the author has managed to get a hold of a Catherine Allen, the director of photography on both Behind the Curtain and Andrew's earlier short film project, Dawn of the New Enemy. I did, in fact, work with Andrew previously on his first project, a short film named The Dawn of the New Enemy. It did well in the more obscure circles and art house groups, but it shit the bed anywhere major. He wasn't completely surprised to see, during the time, you'd be rightfully just in calling it too experimental. My memory of the full story is really spotty, and I do not possess a copy of the film, but I do recall that it initially seemed to focus on a man who was deathly afraid of the sunrise, and spends the rest of the film reconfiguring his house in preparation for it. Now, I can't exactly recall why he was afraid, but if memory serves me right, it had something to do with that ghastly ending I spent what felt like a century working on in post. A sort of megalithic godhead that was not exactly happy. Okay, so we have an experimental director from the 1970s who made a short film that didn't do all that well, but we know that this short film contained a lot of what seems like symbolism and dreamlike imagery. That's a good primer. Despite the lack of success of this short film, Andrew manages to score six early morning spots for a miniseries, Behind the Curtain. But we quickly learn that the production was plagued with problems. First of all, the 16mm camera that they had rented for the production kept acting strange. They would find superimposed images over their footage that they didn't remember filming, and it would sometimes seemingly start recording all by itself. But based on Catherine's emails, it sounds like even if this ghost in the machine hadn't been present during the production, the contents of the actual show were equally as puzzling. And from the sounds of it, you'd be hard pressed to notice the difference between the unintentionally strange side effects of this faulty camera and the intentional strangeness of Andrew's vision. Andrew had sourced a variety of props. Where he got them exactly was never made clear. Kath claims he simply found them. Further issues mounted in post. The color would often screw up, random cuts and jumps, and further superimposed images. Before the episode aired, Andrew had commissioned a promo slot to advertise his debut program. Surprisingly, it's the box So, oh, you want to talk about it? We should talk about it. Because at this point you've surely seen it, right? It seems that whatever or wherever this void is, it's not completely empty, for within it is... something. In the video description of this YouTube upload, we find this. Some who have reportedly witnessed this Lynchian advert claim the shot of the featureless face running for at least half a minute before the title appeared. Some claimed it never appeared in the first place, and instead was just a black space. So either the nature of old CRT televisions was playing tricks on people, or there is something not quite right 
with the footage from this series. In fact, if we go back to the shot of the superimposed door from earlier, there he is as well. As we keep following the thread down over several emails, Catherine starts recounting the plot lines of the episodes that aired before the show was pulled, including several mentions of a guide, someone that helps someone else, a child, navigate through an endless, dark void. And I think we'll stop there for now. This project has not been going on very long and I want you to experience what there is of it so far for yourself. Now, I'd like to think that what I have to offer that is at least somewhat unique in this space is that I have successfully created and completed at least one unfiction project before and it managed to garner some attention. And I absolutely don't mean to say or imply that therefore I'm some sort of like authority on this. In fact, I think that would be uh, very dumb to try and claim to know anything about anyone else creative process and intent. But where other channels mostly talk about these types of projects from a standpoint of being a consumer of them, I'm hoping that my background will allow for me to discuss these projects from a slightly different angle, i.e. the angle of being a non-fiction creator myself. And obviously there's no definitive guide or rule book and everyone has a different process when it comes to how they approach creating their own project. And I very likely don't know much more than anyone else about this or any other project. But I can tell you one thing that I know for absolute sure, one very universal fact. This level of quality exclusively comes from true dedication and passion. There's simply no getting around that. The attention to detail here is just astounding. We have fun and simple easter egg-like details like the Sun editor being named Joel MacLeod in what I can only assume is a reference to the king of royalty-free music, Kevin MacLeod. There are immersive details such as the exact camera model being mentioned uh, in one of the emails, lending so much to the believability of the project as a whole. And I mean last but certainly not least is just the quality of the edits here. The film grain on both the video and the still images, the paper textures, the development imperfections, it's all very seamless. And while you might think that this sort of aesthetic is just a matter of, you know, putting some grain on top of your video and then choosing the overlay blend mode, you'd be very mistaken. Trust me. All in all, the creator of this project, Miss Harry Price on Twitter, has done uh, what I think is an outstanding job so far. And I mean, this has hopefully only just begun. I will note that while I did get some indications that this is an ARG project, I've also gotten some indications that it might not be. So if this doesn't continue or really go anywhere after this, it still stands on its own just the way it is very well. So you should still check it out. And if this in fact is an ARG project and it's gonna, you know, keep going after this, then it's likely only just begun and I am so stoked to see where it goes next and I think you should be as well. A link to the Twitter thread can be found in the description below. Please take five minutes out of your day and, you know, read through it and also check out the video content, give the author a follow while you're at it. And one last thing, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. The next project takes place on YouTube, on a channel named The VHS Tapes of Old. The channel has, at the time of recording this, 8 videos published, adding up to a total runtime of 39 minutes. And this project has a setup that, if you've spent any time in this space before, will feel pretty familiar. A normal, innocent man has found a strange VHS tape. In the description of this first video, we learn that the uploader initially intended for this channel to be a showcase of the various VHS tapes from the old wooden chest in his living room, along with his own commentary of the various memories he and his family has attached to these movies. 
These uploads were, however, taken down due to copyright problems. And honestly, that's a vibe. He then continues on. One of the tapes in the chest caught my eye recently. Monsters from Planet Monstrous. Sick. Surely the creators meant monstrous. It isn't something I remember ever watching, but the case says copyright 1996, so it's far too recent to be something from my parents' childhoods. I can't find any info on this show or any related company online. This stop motion slash claymation show is obscure to the point that this tape is the only proof I have of its existence. As you can see, the tape is heavily damaged. It was ashore, just trying to find a section that was even playable. If anyone knows anything about this old show, please hit me up in the comments. And just like that, we're off. Let's see what's on the tape. Okay, so just like the uploader said, this looks to be an old stop motion show for children. Not that much more to it, other than the fact that the tape is obviously heavily damaged. Let's move on to the second upload. Here we start off with some static, followed by scenes from the same series that we saw in the previous entry. However, pretty soon, this happens. This cake wants a piece of you! Hurrah! Techno wash, techno wash. Techno wash, techno wash. Techno wash, techno wash. Techno wash. Techno wash. Okay, so. Uh, I guess this is an ad for a show called Techno Wars. A little bit odd to slip that into an episode of something else, but let's continue. Uh-huh. Okay. Constant Monarch in the U.S. Fire Product Safety Department wants you to know about the mandatory recall of any children watching this commercial. <laughs> This had me a bit confused, because the VHS tape that we saw in the first upload didn't seem like a home recording from a TV, it rather looked like a mass-produced and commercially sold tape, so... Why are these ad breaks here? Well, taking a look down at the description, the uploader seems to be wondering the same thing. I painstakingly scrolled through the VHS tape and found another stretch that's playable. It all seems like standard children's show stuff, from what I can tell. What's odd is that this tape seems to contain commercial breaks, as if it were recorded off of the TV. The cassette looks like official merchandise, with box art and labels and everything, but apparently it's a taped broadcast. The ads are for shows and products slash services that I mostly can't find any details about anywhere on the net much like the show itself. In some cases, I can't even form a clue as to what's being advertised. Okay, so we have this tape that seems to be mass-produced, yet it contains all these unhinged commercial spots for things that seemingly don't exist. Let's 
go deeper. In the description of the third video, we learn of why the tape isn't being uploaded all at once. Due to the quality of the tape, the uploader's VCR keeps attempting to auto-track the footage. This means that whenever that happens, the screen just cuts to blue and the uploader has to eject the tape, manually twist the reels of the tape to get past the damaged part, insert the tape again and start recording again as well. As for the contents of the third video, we again get mostly commercials. There's a board game called Faces of Terror, a man advertising something by the name Gematsis, Blockulate Chocolate, a video game called Frode Hopman's Adventures, and many, many more ads. And what we're seeing here is the format of this series beginning to crystallize. What was originally meant to be a documentation of a seemingly lost to time children's cartoon has instead pivoted to focus more on the strange ads featured on the tape, rather than on the contents of the show itself. In the description, the uploader notes that It took me over a month to find this next stretch of playable content. Too bad it's mostly just commercials. Or maybe that's a blessing, since I find the ad breaks more interesting than the show at this point. In the next video, things get even more strange. It starts off with a segment from what seems to be a lottery show. Following this, we get a bumper for Channel 9 celebrating 9,990 years of television. And then we're back into the cartoon, which unfortunately gets drowned in tape damage and static. But hold on just a second. Did you catch that? During the static, something very interesting happens. The characters can be seen talking to this star monster creature. And then we immediately cut to them, now holding weapons, surrounded by several creatures. That's not a thing that happens with VHS tapes. No matter how damaged it is, it wouldn't just randomly cut to a much later point in the tape. It doesn't make any sense. And sure enough, when the uploader looks closer at the tape, he finds that someone has physically cut segments out of the tape and then taped it back together. Whatever it is that happens during this episode of the show, or the next commercial break for all we know, someone really doesn't want anyone to see it. Now when I said that I was only going to scratch the surface of these projects, it couldn't be more true than it is with this one. Most of these commercials hold a lot more information than what you can see at first glance. And let me tell you that if you like solving puzzles or riddles, this is the project for you. The YouTube channel Icemaster has dedicated a considerable amount of time and effort into figuring out the various messages and ciphers of these commercials. And after watching his videos, I can tell you that this shit goes deep. To just give you a little taste of how deep it goes and bear with me here as I can barely follow this myself, remember this ad for Gematsis? Well, Icemaster figured out that the grid you see the man standing on is a dualist grid. Now what is a dualist grid you may ask? Uh, I'll let Iceman explain that for you. Let's get down to business. The dualist grid is a magic square with an order of 18 and a magic constant of 999. What this means is that the sum of each individual row, column, and full diagonal is 999. There are a total of 324 values on the grid. The only unusual things about the grid are the presence of negative numbers and that one space is marked differently from all the others. Numbers on the grid range from negative 106 to 217. The odd space in the bottom left corner of the grid has a value of zero. There are no repeating numbers. I have actually solved the dualist grid, or at least I think I have. Through painstaking experimentation using spreadsheet software, I was able to deduce all the values on the grid and verify that they all equal 999. This took me about seven days. The process is similar to the game of Sudoku, but not quite. So by looking at various numbers that can be found throughout the various commercials and through what I can only imagine to be a combination of black magic and copious amounts of even blacker coffee, Iceman solved the dualist grid. But what does that do for us? Well, I'll save you the long explanation and just give you the answer. Gematsis refers to the Gematria system, which is the practice of assigning numerical values to letters and words. Essentially, every letter is assigned a value, and from this we can start decoding numbers into letters. 
In a segment called What's in the Card today, we get references to a character named Theta. I won't go into her in this video, because that's for you to explore yourself, but just keep that in mind for now. Okay, now remember the ad for Frode Hoffman's Adventure? At first glance, not much is going on here, but let's say that we were to count all of the lily pads that Frode hops between here. Well, then you'd find that there are 46 of them. Now, let's take a look at how Frode hops. He jumps from space 9 to 3 to 37, 1, 8, 20, 1, 8, and then he begins a long jump back to the beginning. We don't get to see where he lands, but I think we can assume that it's on lily pad number 3, aka the letter A. Say, Theta. And let me give you one more. <sighs> okay. During the writing of this video, I noticed that at the end of upload number six, before the auto tracking screen, a string of characters appears on screen. From what I was able to find, no one had figured out the meaning of these, so of course, I had to try. To do this, I employed the help of Dave, who a few years ago now used to crack my own ciphers that I created for 10 tapes, often a little quicker than I would have preferred. And so we started chipping away at this. We started with the most obvious first step, taking three letter words and assuming them to be either the word and or the, and one letter words and assuming them to be either I or A. I couldn't get this to make sense, however, and then we also had this two-letter word that ended with the supposed A slash Y, and while there are two-letter words that end with A or I, it's not very common, and besides, we couldn't make any progress on any of the other parts of the text. We then noticed some repetitions in the text, and upon further inspection, even more repetitions. In fact, there was so much repetition that this word right here contains the entirety of this word, this word and almost the entirety of these three words as well, this one being just one character different. So this can't be plain text, we thought, so instead we did a frequency analysis and assigned each of these characters a random letter, which led to the realization that we have 13 different characters and that these four characters look suspiciously similar and get repeated quite frequently. So for now, let's take those characters out, which leaves us with nine characters and four characters. Curiously, nine times four is 36, which just happens to be the exact numbers of characters if you count all of the letters of the alphabet plus the numbers 0 to 9. So if we were to arrange these characters like this, we should be left with 36 slots, and through some more mental gymnastics on the account of Dave, we finally end up with this. And with that, we can conclude that this text reads... And earlier in the series, during the card segment, we were introduced to a character named 360, and interestingly enough, in video 7, during a segment about high-value names, we have this list of names that appear, and the name Blurge Aladdin adds up to exactly 360. And curiously, Blurge Aladdin is on here twice, but the second time he is Blurge Nate Roney Aladdin, which is a name that can also be seen at the top of the list, and what that means I don't know, because it was at this point that I realized I had spent two days uh, just watching these videos again and again and figuring out these codes, and I had to get back to actually working on the script for the video you're watching right now. So evidently, uh, the puzzles of this project goes hard. But despite popular belief, I don't really have a good brain for this sort of stuff. I wouldn't have been able to come up with like half of this shit if it wasn't for Dave. So if you're like me, but you don't have a Dave to consult, don't worry. This series isn't only puzzles. There is also a lot of lore that I haven't even touched on. There is definitely a story here, and some of it is slowly being drop fed to us through code, and other parts are right there in the videos, and it all adds up to this wildly fascinating story about this alternate universe, a land full of various fantasy creatures, and it has this like rich world history, and I truly hope that you feel inspired to go check it out, because I really think you should. 
And I do feel a little bad for spending so long describing the puzzles, but not taking more time to talk about the narrative. But I know that some of you freaks out there get off on this shit, so I thought it'd be a good way to introduce you to it. This series, Planet Monsterous, Monsterous, uh, is wildly underrated, and it seems to have flown under the radar of way too many. So much time, effort, thought, and obviously passion has gone into creating all of these different segments, and they have a wide variety of art styles and aesthetics. Everything has that charming DIY vibe to it, and you can just tell that the creator behind this project actually has a story that they want to tell. And perhaps even more importantly, they're having a fucking blast doing it. I really do implore you to go check this entire project out. The link, like everything else, is in the description, along with a link to a fan-hosted Discord server that I found, which was pretty hard to find, so uh, you're welcome. Also, uh, you'll see a bunch of posts by me spamming the chat uh, if you go there. Oh, hey, I was just in my bathtub here taking a bath. I don't really have time to make a Patreon ad spot, so uh, this is that. Hey, please go to my Patreon. If you could give me like, th let's say $5 per month, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, it just goes to bills and, and food and it helps uh, for me uh, to not be in a constant state of, of panic. Patreon.com slash Jeffiot. Uh, let's get on with the video. For our final project of the day, I'd like to ask if you remember Nauru. You know, the indie rock band, they were big back in like the early 2000s-ish. They had that uh, one album, um, like A Murder of Cows or something like that, I think. Um, and then the, the main guy uh, split off with the rest of the band, started making solo music, um, you know, Drama uh, Drottning, Wherever You Go, There You Are. Uh, shaking hands and there might have been one more or maybe not uh, but yeah Axel uh, Axel Lundén was his name I'm pretty sure now if none of that made any sense to you you've never heard of any of these albums bands or people then you might be asking yourself who in the hell is Axel Lundén and you're in luck, because I'm about to start telling you that story, and then you can go for yourself and find out the entirety of what happened. Isn't that convenient? So let's start from the beginning, at least as far as the people who've been actively partaking in this project are concerned as being the beginning. Sometime around spring of 2021, people started encountering these strange posters for a spring tour of the artist Axel Lundén. These posters were found around Oslo, Norway, Bergen, Norway, Stockholm, Sweden, Karlstad, Sweden, and Reykjavik, Iceland. But the thing that immediately stuck out to people was the year, 2014. Why was a 2014 tour being advertised in 2021, seven years too late? And while none of these venues actually exist, they all have real counterparts that are pretty big venues, which of course begs the question yet again, who is this Axel Lundén? Soon a website was discovered and this is where the majority of this project takes place. About a year ago I actually streamed myself investigating this website and I could have sworn I saved the VOD for when I inevitably uh, made a video about it, uh, but for now I can't find it. If I do find it I'll upload it to my second channel Extra Jeff, link up in the corner. Now let's do some exploring. The first thing we're greeted with on the site is that we see that Axel's new album, Under the Surface, seems to have recently been released. So let's take that as our first lead and head on over to the discography section. Here we can see Axel's four solo albums as well as five albums under the name Naure. Clicking on Under the Surface, Axel's newest album, reveals something a little puzzling, however. Just like the posters, this was released back in 2014. From later context clues, uh, I can tell you that this project doesn't take place in 2014. Uh, kinda. It kinda does, but it doesn't. It kinda does, but it doesn't, so 
it doesn't, but it kind of does, but it doesn't. Let's just hold on to that for now. So this means that this website seems to have been essentially at a standstill since 2014. Let's keep going and this time we'll head to the about section, which we probably could have started with. Okay, here we go. Who in the hell is Axel Lundén? Axel Lundén is a Swedish-American indie rock slash folk artist who rose to prominence in the early 2000s at the helm of the internationally renowned rock ensemble Nauru. In the wake of splitting with Nauru in 2008, Axel went on to release a series of critically acclaimed solo albums. His fourth solo album, Under the Surface, was released in April of 2014 to absolute crickets. Like, literally no one cared and blah blah blah. If you don't already know who I am, why on earth are you here? Who in the hell is Axel Lundén? I guess a better question would be, who was I? You might say I was that stereotypical guy who had it all. A successful career, a glimmering reputation, a mantle cluttered with awards, no shortage of gigs, married to the love of my life, surrounded by friends. I was... happy. And bit by bit, I watched it all disintegrate. I guess I deserve it. So if you do know who I am, why are you still here? Who in the hell am I? I'm a specter of the man I used to be. And I don't know if I could have asked for a better introduction to a project like this, honestly. Like, if this is the core of what this story is about, which, at least as far as I've gotten, uh, it is, this is honestly a pretty genius way to present a new visitor with all the necessary information, while still keeping everything within the universe of the story. Like, imagine if every project just had an about section where you could click and it's just like, yeah, this guy uh, encountered a slendy boy out in the woods. Like that would uh, make things a lot easier to get into. Uh, yeah, a guy found a video game and there seems to be some family drama in there. And yeah, as it turns out, it was Slender Man the whole time. That'd make so many YouTubers job way easier. <laughs> What this doesn't tell us, however, is the full story. What exactly was it that made Axel's world crumble around him? And perhaps more importantly, where is Axel today? And to answer that, I'm gonna tell you exactly where to go. But at first, I just wanna say that the beauty of this project and its presentation is how you don't have to know where to go. By simply browsing the site casually, you'll pick up on all of these little details, these breadcrumbs that's been methodically sprinkled in through every little piece of it, and eventually they start telling you a story. Like if you head on over to the news section, you'll be met with several cancelled upcoming shows, all dated to 2014. Below you'll find little updates from Axel, essentially little blog posts starting all the way back in 2013. Through these short blog posts we learn that Axel cancelled several shows back in 2013, but that he is happy to announce that the shows are back, they're going to happen after all. He says that it took longer than he initially thought to get back on his feet, but he doesn't disclose what happened or why these shows were cancelled in the first place. If you keep going through the rest of these blog posts, you'll start encountering quite a few names that keep popping up. Jun, Kåre, Thor, Lars, Lisa, Maya, Onni, Jon, Fredrik and several others. And if we do our due diligence as explorers here, we'll soon find that several of these characters have social media accounts. Twitter accounts, Instagram accounts, YouTube pages, Reddit accounts, chat logs, comments, all full of interactions with each other and with other players of the game. Furthermore, if you dig even a little bit deeper, you'll find a bunch of secret pages, hidden messages in the source code, messages in file names of images, and the list goes on. For example, some of these people mention playing in another band at some point called Attax, and look at that, they have their own website with a full biography and discography. 
Maybe you'll stumble upon a hidden YouTube video that'll lead you to a hidden Imgur post that contains a link to this memorial site for Mickey Batty where we can learn more about what happened to him and how he relates to Axel. And slowly we start getting an idea of who all of these people are, how they play into this, who they know and how they are as a person. But at this point you might be thinking that this all sounds a little scattered or hard to follow but there's a very good reason for that. I have intentionally held off on telling you about what I consider at least to be the core of this project. By clicking on read and then choosing under the surface you'll be presented with 14 chapters. These were released over time as the main content drops for this project but lucky you it's all here. Starting with chapter 1 you'll find 15 pages of Arial size 12 text, essentially a novel, chronicling the 18th of October 2014 from the perspective of Axel. Here we finally get an insight into this elusive character and his current state of mind. Note that when I say current I mean in 2014 when these kind of diary entries are taking place but the rest of the project is taking place uh, you know right now in real time. Hence the confusion about 2014 versus right now before. Hopefully that makes sense. It doesn't have to. You can treat the writing in the read section as you know its own standalone writing if you want to but yeah that's that's how that works. We get to read Axel's thoughts, his feelings and his views of himself, his friends and his current situation. The tension between Kåre and myself dampens the sentimental sense of adventure I typically experience at the beginning of a journey by train. He sips his coffee in stony silence, his handsome features pinched into an ugly measured glare, but I suspect he's watching me from the corner of his eye. We haven't even left Stockholm and already he's had it with me. It's a line I seem to cross more quickly with each passing day. It makes my heart twinge. I'm sorry, I whisper. I'll shut up now. He nods, his eyelashes fluttering as if attempting to subdue yet another eye roll. He says nothing in response. Soon the waterfront the three iconic golden crowns suspended over City Hall glide by my window, gorgeous even on the greyest of days. Stockholm, my home. A far cry from the hideous homogenized street plans of my suburban Minnesota childhood. Twice the size of Oslo where I spent my teens. Perched upon open water and bustling with life, a proper city. A paradox scattered across a series of islands and yet curiously cohesive. Stockholm is the first place I ever loved and the first ever to embrace me. I pluck up my phone and film the point at which she slips away, like the moment when you can no longer spot a forlorn lover waving from the platform. The tagging on the rust brown bridge passes by like Morse code in rhythmic punctuation as we pick up speed. Soon concrete warehouses are all that's left to see, the graffiti scarred ugly outskirts of an otherwise beautiful city. With my nomadic upbringing I'll never be a national of anywhere, but my heart it lives in Stockholm, and in Stockholm it shall die. Uh, and uh, if that excerpt uh, didn't make it exceptionally clear, uh, allow me to say it, this project has amazing writing. Like it's truly something special. I remember the first time when I was going through this on stream, I had to stop at like several points just to go, how is this so well written? And also as you've probably gathered by now, uh, under the surface, which is the first part of the uh, who in the hell is Axel Lundén project, uh, is not a horror project. Because despite the fact that horror is by far the most popular genre to explore in this medium, it's obviously completely possible to just create anything in it. Uh, in the same way that books aren't limited to romance and movies aren't limited to action, ARGs and unfiction projects aren't limited to horror. 
And while, as I said in the beginning, many projects in the ARG genre struggles, I happen to know that non-horror projects struggle even more to find an audience, and I can't really think of a clearer example of that than Axel Lundén. For this is truly an exceptional project, and it belongs up there with the big names. Yes, an incredible amount of time has gone into writing these characters and their bios, backstories and interactions with each other. And yes, countless hours has gone into creating all of these different accounts and managing them. And that's not even mentioning building an entire website, commissioning and creating art for every single record cover, blog post and website page, taking photos and videos, planning out content drops, recording podcast interviews with several actors portraying the different characters, writing goddamn lyrics for these uh, fictional songs, actually composing, recording and releasing the music from not only Axel, but for several other fictional bands that get mentioned. And yes, more time than most people have spent on anything has been spent on just writing the main texts of this project. But the truth is that at the end of the day, none of that would really matter if the end result wasn't good, if it wasn't engaging or interesting. That would also explain why this project has such a small, very dedicated, but still small community surrounding it. But that simply isn't the case. And if you've ever created something, anything that you felt the least bit proud of, you know how disheartening it can be to finally put it out there into the ether after spending all of this time on it only to be met with silence. Maybe not complete silence, but when put next to the Herculean effort that you put into the thing, it might as well be silence when it feels like the world is purposefully ignoring the thing you've so lovingly created. When the math doesn't check out, when the equation of effort versus payoff simply doesn't make any sense. I've had that happen to me, and uh, to be frank, it's probably my least favorite feeling in the world. And it's so easy at that point to come to the conclusion that what you've created uh, just probably wasn't as good as you thought it was. And I don't know if I have the power to like reach anyone, to make anyone else feel what I feel or see what I see, but on the off chance that anyone needs to hear it right now or ever, um, that's not true. Uh, it's not ever, you know, I'm not even going to go into the fact that we all know that numbers doesn't equal quality because rationally we all know that, but emotionally we don't feel it. And unfortunately, uh, creative people uh, feeling it is what's going to matter to us at the end of the day. But for what it's worth, it's not true. And it was worth it. And you did good. I, prom <clears throat> I promise. Or in so many words, under the surface is so fucking good. And I really hope you check it out. Thank you. Holy fuck. I don't have like an outro planned or anything, um, but maybe I should say something right here because the video can't just end like that. These are three amazing projects. Sorry I got a bit emotional there at the end. Uh, that's just how I am. Uh, please check them out. Uh, thanks for watching this video so far. Um, th there's a Patreon, check that out. I did probably an ad spot for that somewhere in the middle of the video, uh, but I'll, I can just mention it again. Uh, somewhere on my screen right now uh, was first my Patreon uh, producers and then the rest of my, my patrons. Uh, and I appreciate all of you a lot. And if you watched this far, uh, you know, check out th this video, um, whatever I decide to put there. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.
and and go go make something. Oh.